Hello everyone, my name is Stavros Vakalis and I'm a member of the Michigan State University team which is composed from Jason Merlo, myself, Corey Hiltov and Jacob Braidal. Jacob won't be with us in this presentation as he has moved on and started working. The system that we built for this competition is a radar for tracking drones. The use of drones has had significant increase in everyday life and consumer applications and due to that there are security implications that must be addressed. Concerns include privacy implications because these little vehicles can have excellent image recording capabilities and they can also carry quite a payload, so this can lead to safety concerns or property damage. In big facilities or even in small houses, there is significant need for a surveillance mechanism that can detect and track drones. Radar is a great candidate due to the fact that microwave radiation has all weather capabilities and can easily penetrate through fog, rain and smoke. Also, radar systems can operate 24 hours per day and they do not need the sun for illumination. As a result, we decided to build a radar system for drone detection and tracking as an example for an everyday application for radar. We also noticed that in the literature there are many works for drone classification and detection, but not as many for a low-cost radar tracker. This is an overview for the frequency modulated continuous wave radar or FMCW radar theory and how it is used for performing range and angle estimation. In this slide I am showing you a single transmitter and two receiver system. The frequency modulated signal is also usually referred as the chirp signal and can be written in this form here as of t for a single period. The frequency of this signal is linearly increasing in every period and usually in the literature they refer to the frequency response of FMCW radar as a sawtooth function. Now the two received signals on the two antennas will be time delayed version of the transmit signal reflected back from the drone target. From the mixing operation and based on the fact that the frequency is increasing linear as a function of time, what will be left here after the down conversion with the transmit signal is the difference in frequencies based on the time delays. So this frequency response here in the two receivers can be very easily mapped to range information again based on the time delay. The angle information now can be found through the difference in frequencies or in ranges between the two receivers. When the drone is residing at some angle theta away from roadside, the two frequency responses of the two receivers won't be exactly the same because the ranges are also not exactly the same. As you see here, R1 and R2 are not exactly the same and the difference now would be a function of angle. Knowing the baseline between the two antennas, you can easily map these two angles and afterwards you can also map angles directly to the difference in frequencies. But is it that simple? Unfortunately, no. Radar returns from a drone can be very weak compared to the surrounding environment. So searching for something that can be used for detecting and differentiating the drone from the rest of the environment, we found out that drones have a very unique velocity response due to their rotating blades. The plot here is the simulated range and Doppler map where we're capturing multiple pulses from a drone at 5 meters and the st strong static target at 10 meters range. By tracking now the phase information along different pulses or by taking a second Fourier transform along this dimension here, we see that the strong static reflector has velocity equal with zero but the drone has a spread velocity response due to the rotating movement of blades. This is the information that we will use to differentiate the drone. Here is an overview of our algorithm. We are capturing multiple pulses in two receivers. You see here receiver 1 and receiver 2. In this plot, each row represents a single pulse and each cube here represents a time sample in what they refer to as the fast time dimension. By stacking up now multiple pulses, like putting the first pulse here, the second pulse in this row, the third, until you have n rows here, multiple pulses can build what they usually refer to as the slow time dimension. By performing first a Fourier transform along the fast time dimension, we are able to conserve the re receive pulse response to range information. By taking now a second Fourier transform along the slow time, we are able to capture velocity information as you see here. The units are power as a function of range and velocity. However, the problem is that this strong response from the surrounding clutter can be very strong compared to the drone. 
For that, we'll be using a moving target indication filter. We're going to filter out all these responses close to velocity equal zero. Doing that, only the drone responses will remain that will be spread out in the velocity axis. If now the mean squared value of this velocity profile is above a threshold, we'll consider the response as a drone. And by comparing the range information in these two receivers, we will be able to localize the drone. Hello, my name is Jason Merlo, and I'm going to be discussing the radar system design and later the software design for this project. The radar system design for this project consisted of one frequency modulated continuous wave transmitter and four coherent receivers. The transmitter design revolved around a Texas Instruments LMX 2491 programmable PLL and ramp generator IC used to create the chirp modulation used for the range and angle estimation. This signal was then amplified by a 32 dB power amplifier and split by a 14 dB coupler prior to being transmitted. Roughly 4% of the transmit power was saved and split off to drive the LO on the down converter mixers. Each of the four receivers utilized a 14.5 dB LNA and an active INQ down converter followed by an active IF filter bank prior to being simultaneously digitized by a measurement computing USB DAC at 100 kilo samples per second. The DAC was also synchronously triggered by the ramp generator to begin sampling at the start of each pulse to minimize any possible phase drift between the two systems. The system may be powered by an external power source with a designed range of 10.8 to 13.2 volts, making it well suited to run off of many common 12 volt power supplies as well as 3 cell lithium polymer batteries. The onboard components also drove the requirement for 6 voltage rails. A 10 volt rail for the active loop filter amplifier was simply driven using a single LDO, however to maintain efficiency a DC to DC converter was used to power the lower voltage rails. This DC to DC converter stepped the input voltage down to an intermediate voltage of 5.5 volts, which was then filtered by successive LDOs to achieve the other desired voltage rails while rejecting the switching noise. To further reduce the noise introduced by switching ICs, ferrite beads and decoupling capacitors were also added to many of the power supply pins of the active devices. To reduce the electromagnetic interference and coupling of the AC noise into the sensitive RF receivers, the board was partitioned into three primary compartments separated by the gold VF fenced areas, which can be seen on the figure on the slide. The left half of the board has the circuitry for the power and transmitter components as these were deemed to be the highest noise sources on the board and also the least susceptible to outside interference. The central section of the board contained the IF filter bank and the power splitter. The right side of the board housed the four receivers, which were individually segmented from each other to avoid crosstalk. Furthermore, VF fencing was added to the edges of all microstrip line to avoid leakage and crosstalk, and to the edges of the board to reduce any unwanted RF from leaking from the edges of the board between the layers. Additionally, this PCB was designed using the open source cross-platform EDA, KiCad, to provide access to the largest audience possible. The board utilized several distributed planar elements which were chosen due to their ease of fabrication and high efficiency at RF frequencies when compared to traditional lumped element components. Each of these elements were designed and simulated using ANSYS HFSS. First, a 3dB Wilkinson RF power divider was designed and used in two locations on the board. The first location was to allow feedback from the output of the VCO into the loop filter and also to be sent to the power output of the amplifier to be transmitted from the radar. The second was utilizing a group of three cascaded power dividers to create a 1 to 4 splitter to drive the LO inputs on the down converter mixers. Additionally, a 14 dB coupler was also used to siphon off roughly 4% of the transmit power to be sent to the down converter mixers, as well as to terminate any reflections coming back from the RF transmit port to avoid damage or ringing in the final stage RF power amp. Finally, a substrate characterization test board was created to independently verify the RF characteristics of the low-cost fiberglass substrate. However, upon receiving the board, it was found that there was large loss introduced by the SMA transitions, which made it difficult to obtain reliable measurements. This did, however, give us an important insight into the need to design a more efficient SMA transition. The root cause of the loss was determined to be the fact that the center conductor was much larger than the 50 ohm line on the board due to the large change in dielectric between the coaxial connector and the fiberglass substrate. As can be seen in the SMA to microstrip transition render, which shows the bare copper with the board substrate and solder mask hidden, all the copper layers directly under the SMA transition were removed and a notch was added to the top layer. 
The length and width of this notch were then optimized using HFSS to find parameters which minimize the reflections at the interface. After optimization, the simulated loss of the transition was reduced from nearly 10 dB in the initial design to roughly 0.3 dB in the final design. Once the fabricated PCBs were received, the assembly took place in a DIY home lab. Due to the decision to use the industry standard QFN packaging, commonly used in high-performance RFICs, which have pads on the bottom of the package, a reflow process was required to assemble the board. To do this, a Controlio V3 reflow oven controller was fitted to a modified toaster oven to create a temperature-controlled reflow oven. While some experimentation was needed to achieve the ideal parameters for the solder stencil pad aperture sizes, and some tuning was required to obtain the desired reflow temperature profile on the homemade reflow oven, the assembly process was able to be completed relatively easily and on the first attempt, with minimal need for rework due to assembly defects, except to remove slight excess solder around some QFN parts and to adjust two misaligned capacitors. Finally, the completed board was packaged in a box with the TI USB to any programmer used for programming the transmitter, as well as the DAC and power supply. An AC power supply is shown in the picture in the slide, however, a three cell LiPo was later added for portability of the system. Hello, my name is Corey Hilton. I am a senior undergraduate at Michigan State University and part of the Michigan State University design team. Today, I will be discussing the antenna design for this project. The antenna equations used for the patch design were found in Bolanus, where the width is calculated using the speed of light, the center frequency, and the relative permittivity. Following this, the effective permittivity can be calculated using the relative permittivity, the height of the dielectric, and the width of the patch prior calculated. Then, finally, the length can be calculated using, again, the speed of light, the center frequency, and the effective permittivity. The microchip dimensions were calculated via line calc, a program uh, subsidy of ADS, Advanced Design System, which allowed us to calculate the width and height of the patch as necessary. This was found using a 50 ohm, a 70.7 ohm, and 100 ohm line for the feet to the patches. With that in mind, we can now talk about the simulated measurements, the 2x2 two two array. The 2x2 two two array was first modeled in ADS for proof of the microstrip application. Then, following that, it was modeled in HFSS to show the simulated S11 and gain. We can see here that for the 2x2 two two array, the S11 run reaches a null of about negative 22 dB. Then, looking at the gain, we can see that the gain maximum of about 10.61 dBi very close to the theoretical maximum of 11 dBi considering the 2x2 two two array, this was considered to be well within acceptable standards. For the 4x4 four four array, similar results could be observed, but to a greater magnitude. As seen with the S11 of the simulated 4x4 four four array, we can see that the S11 run reaches a null of almost negative 37.5, precisely at 5.8 GHz, which made it very useful for us, especially as a transmitter. We can see for the gain, that this gain pattern is more focused than the previous 2x2 two two array, with a gain of 16.2 dBi, much stronger than the 10.6 dBi we saw before, which made it more ideal to use as the transmitter as opposed to a receiver. Once both the 2x2 two two and 4x4 four four array were simulated, they could be manufactured. One thing to consider when these were manufactured was over etching, as we used an etching process to fabricate the boards. We can see that neither of these, neither the 4x4 four four nor the 2x2 two two array, precisely lined up at 5.8 GHz. This is because the estimated overetching of 3% was incorrect, as the final overetching was estimated to be about 1.5%. Despite this, we can see that our transmitter performed fairly well under these circumstances, with a final S01 at 5.8 GHz of about negative 28 dB. Well, the receivers showed up at negative 15 and negative 22 dB, respectively. The antennas were manufactured by our lab technician, Brian Wright. In this process, we had to account for an estimated 1.5% over etching. The antenna design was dilated to counter this factor. As can be seen by the pictures, on the right, a side feed was employed to minimize the coupling between the patches and the microstrip feed lines. In this design, a feed line of 50 ohms, 70.7 ohms, and 100 ohms was employed. These numbers were chosen because of their thickness relative to the patches, which again would help to reduce coupling. The patch's final dimensions measured to be 16.91 millimeters 
by 12.85 millimeters, very close to the calculated dimensions of these patches. The 4x4 array, of course, has the more focused beam width compared to the 2i2, which is why we used a 4x4 for the transmitter. Finally, showing the antenna design below for the 2x2 array, you can see that we used the side feed. This was to minimize the coupling between the patch and the microchips, as these patches were quite small and we used a 0.95 lambda separation to avoid this coupling, overlap of the patches, and the side lobes that we would see from the patches being misaligned. We will now briefly discuss details of the drone detection and tracking software implemented for this project. The software for this project was built around the Python Radar Toolkit, or Piratic, a Python library currently being developed by the Delta Group at Michigan State University to allow for the rapid creation of software capable of real-time data acquisition, data playback, radar signal processing, and visualization. For this project, significant additions were created to Piratic. A new DAC driver was written to interface with the measurement computing DAC, as well as a greatly restructured radar class with transmitter and receiver subclasses, a new tracker, dubbed APS tracker, and spectrogram, range Doppler, and polar tracking plot widget classes. Utilizing the objects provided by Piratic, creating the interface for the APS dashboard program was made significantly simpler by abstracting away many of the data recording, control, and synchronization issues focusing only on the important aspects such as tracking and visualization. The Piratic library is still in active development, however, a pre-beta copy of the library software is released accompanying this software and can be accessed on the GitLab with the rest of the software developed for this project or by emailing the authors. Here, the main dashboard for the tracking visualization and data acquisition can be seen. On the left, the recording controls and DAC information are displayed, followed by the controls for saving and playing back pre-recorded data as well as loading different dataset files. On the right, a polar tracking plot displaying the estimated location of the drone in yellow and the estimated trajectory of the drone in blue can be seen. Below the polar plot are the range Doppler maps created from the two active receivers during this recording. The zero Doppler column is removed to eliminate clutter while searching for the drone, as Stavros was previously mentioned. Now we will show our experimental drone tracking results. Here you see a photograph of the experimental system, the transmit antenna on the top, the two receiver antennas on the sides, and the lab for the real-time visualization. And inside the box you have the radar board and the data acquisition device. Again, a closer look, the 4x4 patch array for the transmitter here. Receiver 1 and Receiver 2, they had 2x2 two two patch arrays. You see the laptop running in real time, the range Doppler maps and the localization plot. And here you have the radar board, the USB programmer for generating the waveforms, the data acquisition device, and the battery below the box. In the following video, the drone will take off from a distance of 4 meters, perform a backwards S pattern extending to a range of 10 meters, then finally return to the takeoff location to land as depicted by the red arrows in this image. Notice that the tracker will only update when a drone is present based on the Doppler spread generated by the propellers of the drone. As the drone flies, the tracker will continue to follow the drone, but once the drone lands, the tracker will stop updating. Here, Corey can be seen holding a corner reflector, tracing out a similar pattern for reference. An experimental demonstration of a frequency modulated continuous wave drone tracking radar has been presented. The radar demonstrates the properties of FMCW radar and the use of multiple receivers to perform detection of arrival estimation and can detect and track drones at a range of at least 10 meters. Furthermore, it has been shown that the system can be replicated inside a home or university lab and can provide many opportunities for teaching radar systems, antenna and microwave system design, and signal processing. Finally, to reach the broadest audience, all the hardware and software has been made open source and is available at the URL on the slide. Thank you for your time, and we hope you've enjoyed this presentation.